Welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpot. This is program number 29 in our series, The Gospel of Mark. We are in chapter 8. We're going to be, uh, well, we're going to pretty well finish chapter 8 soon. But we've got two stories for this program. One is Jesus heals a blind man at Bethsaida, and then Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. So we got two stories, and we're going to start right in with the first one, where Jesus heals a blind man at Bethsaida. Now, where is Bethsaida? Well, it is at the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. And it was right there by the Sea of Galilee. The word Bethsaida means house of fisher. In other words, fishermen live there. And so this is where the story takes place. The full title of Bethsaida was Bethsaida Julius. Philip the Tetrarch, one of the sons of Herod the Great, had converted what was really a small little fishing village into a larger city, and he named it for Augustus's daughter, Julia. And the potentates of that time that were under the authority of Rome did a lot of that sort of thing uh, to uh, ingratiate, perhaps, uh, or to honor the emperors that they owed their, uh, uh, their local kingship or leadership to. So this is where this takes place. It was uh, quite a fertile and beautiful area in that part of the, the world, and still is, I understand. So we get into the story now, Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, that would be Jesus and his disciples, and so some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. By this time, the healings of Jesus were widely known, no secret to anybody. And wherever Jesus was moving from place to place, uh, people would bring people that needed help. This is about midpoint in Jesus' ministry. It, uh, it, it's called the retirement uh, ministry, where Jesus is trying to get away from the crowds as much as possible. He's not doing a lot of the larger events. Um, events is probably the wrong word, but where people would come and there would be a lot of miracles and so on. Uh, he wants to get away with his disciples. You've heard me mention this a number of times. So as soon as he gets to Bethsaida, perhaps hoping to get away from the crowds again, lo and behold, here comes uh, some people, and they beg him to touch him. In their mind, the healing would occur with a touch. Whether it had to occur with a touch is not a, a biblical statement, really, because Jesus healed at a distance at some time. So there wasn't a, a stock process that was going on, but this is what people wanted him to do, it was to touch this blind man. And he took the blind man by the hand, he touched him, took him by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Now, this is, to me, a most peculiar kind of healing. Apparently, Jesus wanted this to be uh, private, not public. So he takes him by the hand walks away, apparently, from everyone, and then he spits on his eyes, spits on his eyes. Now, you wonder why that's so. One of the reasons, I think, that we have so many different processes that are followed by healing in the Scripture so that we wouldn't, subsequent followers of Jesus, wouldn't just lapse into a rite or a ritual it had to be done just this way every time. It became magical. We see that this eventually happened in the church, starting in the third century, um, a lot of it having to do with one of the Alexandrians, Cyprian. Uh, much of the ritualizing of the events of the church would take place. Like it moved from the simple casting out of demons to exorcism. And that's it was a rite that duly ordained people would conduct only. 
earlier for more than 200 years, that wasn't the case at all. But it became such. And so I think that we find the different uh, kinds of healings, the things that took place, to differ so that we wouldn't lapse into just rites and rituals that had to be um, performed superstitiously correct all the time. So he spit on his eyes. Can you imagine if you're filming this? Jesus getting close enough to this guy that he spits on his eyes. Now, he was blind. He couldn't see what Jesus was doing. But here he's going to have this experience of having his eyes spit on and then laid his hands on him. Well, you don't know if he laid his hands on his shoulder, on his head. Where? We don't know, thankfully. But he laid his hands on him and he asked him, do you see anything? Jesus asked him a question, do you see anything? He doesn't say you're healed or be healed. He says, do you see anything? Again, we don't know the actual reason why Jesus did this. My opinion would be, well, it had to do with that particular individual. Jesus treated different people differently. This man, somehow Jesus knew, would better respond in the way that he was doing. And then again, of course, to avoid ritualizing uh, healing. Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Now, here you get the information that um, uh, the person had sight at one point. Whether the blindness was a result of uh, some kind of uh, organic illness, whether it was genetically based, perhaps it was uh, due to uh, an accident, an injury of some kind. We don't know those details. But he was able to identify, he had obviously seen men before, he had seen trees before, some point in his life. We don't know the details. But that's what he reports. So I guess if you're Jesus, you have to think to yourself, well, uh, this is not yet complete. Some people will say, why, why, why didn't Jesus just do it, make it complete? What, what are this interim thing going on? What's that all about? And we don't know. Uh, we tend to speculate. And I try to let people know when I'm speculating because some of my statements don't always emerge directly from the scripture. And I, I hope to be able to say, well, this is my idea. This is my opinion. This is the way I see it. Uh, in other words, trying to fill in the gaps, but that's all I'm doing. <clears throat> so we don't really know why Jesus did this. The reality is he did that. That's how he did it. So it's, the blind man is now starting to see. He sees, says, I see men, but they look like trees walking. He didn't have it clear. Who knows? Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. Now, there we go. Gave you a little mystery. Where did Jesus lay his hands? I said his shoulder or his head. No, laid his hands on his eyes. Very clear. I don't know what he did, touched them like this. Who knows? But he touched his eyes the first time and he does it again. It, I don't know if it was a way of uh, encouraging, inspiring, giving confidence, affirming. We don't know. But that's what he does. And it says, and he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Ah, there's mystery involved in this, this particular healing. It's a peculiar one. I mean, the spitting on the eyes, the double laying his hands on the eyes, um, not, getting it, not getting clear sight right away. We don't know why this is, how it works that way. But anyway, this is the story that we have. And then it says, and he sent, us to him, sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. And I think the reason for that, and again, this is speculation on my part, was such a healing would again attract attention. And who knows what might have followed. The speculation is that Jesus wanted time alone 
with his disciples, and healing gets everybody excited. Uh, if there's been more fraud uh, perpetrated uh, in the promise of being healed than perhaps anything else, anything from the healing of the mind to the body, et cetera, et cetera, has been, well, it's been played out down through human history, and it is still alive and well in our own area. When you touch our bodies, we will become desperate, especially if it's something serious that impacts our style of life, our ability to make a living, to enjoy our living and take care of families and being part of the community. When that happens, we'll almost do anything, and it opens the door to all kinds of mischief. All right, now we're going to get to the second story, and the more significant, in fact, probably one of the most important stories in the Bible. And this is Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Now, I want to explain the word Christ. It means Messiah. It is a word that um, means anointed one. It comes from uh, the Hebrew, the idea of the Messiah. And the Messiah is God's anointed one, the one God sends. And we find in the scripture that the Messiah actually is God. God becomes flesh. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. So the Messiah, the Christ, it, it's one and the same. Two different languages. So, verse 27 in Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Now, that's up north quite a bit. It's up into modern-day Syria. Probably, well, it's pretty close to Mount Hermon. It's uh, in, a, in one of the most fertile, beautiful places, uh, the Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, the Caesarea Philippi uh, is also got its name um, from uh, Philip, the son of Herod again, the same one who renamed Bethsaida to Bethsaida Julia, and <coughs> he, uh, he gave it that name, Caesarea Philippi. And so uh, they had, I have a little note here, they had shrines of Pan and the Nymphs there at Caesarea Philippi. So this is where this is going to take place. It's away, not even taking place really in what would be described as modern day Israel. So he and his disciples are now pretty far away, pretty well guaranteed that there's not going to be a lot of crowds interfering. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? <clears throat> what it appears that Jesus is doing, he's preparing for his leaving. He's preparing for his leaving. He's not going to be around. He's got a relatively short time, a year maybe a year and a half with his disciples. That's all he's got left. Jesus knows what's coming. We're going to get to that in a program or two from now. And there's speculation as to who he is. The reason there was speculation is that at that particular era, there was a lot of confusion about the role that the Messiah would play. There was no speculation among Jewish people about Messiah. They, they believed from their sacred scripture that a Messiah was going to come. And they knew that there was going to be a messenger that was going to herald his arrival. We find that in Malachi chapter 4 and in another place in Isaiah. So they were expecting a Messiah, and they wanted a Messiah badly. They were under the iron boot of Rome, and Rome was very severe. They wanted money. They wanted uh, no disturbance. And they crushed any kind of rebellion savagely and quickly. And they had done it many times already in this first century of the, uh, the common era. They had done it many times. They hated Rome. The Jewish people hated Rome. They had built the Tower of Antonio, Antonio right up against of the wall of the, of the temple in, uh, in Jerusalem, 
and higher than the wall so that they could look down and see what was going on in the temple. And the Jewish people hated Rome. They wanted a Messiah to rise up and throw off the yoke of Rome. That's what they were looking for. So there was confusion because Jesus didn't act that way. He just had 12 guys. He made no attempt to um, do anything against Rome. He didn't talk against Rome. They didn't run around doing any kind of mischief. They really were just common, ordinary, quiet citizens. And this confused people. Here was a guy that cast out demons, healed people, multiplied food, walked on the water, calmed the storms. The disciples were confused themselves. They didn't know. But now Jesus has to make it clear who he is. He's becoming more and more forthright about what's going to come. We will see in a passage that's coming up. So he says, who, people, who do people say that I am? And they answered and they told him, John the Baptist. Now, why John the Baptist? John the Baptist was dead. Remember Herod, Antipas. Um, Herod had killed John, had him executed. But he, Herod heard about Jesus and said, well, that's John the Baptist brought to life again. So people were thinking already, well, maybe this is really John the Baptist come back to life. So they said, well, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Elijah was the prince of the prophets, the one who was carried away in the fiery chariot. In the fiery chariot. And so Elijah being the great prophet, they thought, well, maybe that's who it is. Now, interesting how that ties in here. Elijah, it was said, was going to come. Well, John the Baptist wasn't a reincarnation of Elijah, and he was not Elijah at all, but he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Uh, many people don't get that. They will, we take the Western mindset that we all have in the West, we apply it to Scripture, and we take everything literally, and that's not the case. One of the chief points is the idea of the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. It's not a magical formula. Many people believe that it is. That you say, well, it's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has to do with who Jesus is, who, who he is and what he did. It is not a formula in the name of Jesus. It's Jesus who does the work, not the name. That would be a magical way of approaching it. Uh, the, that magical approach is the, the, the fruit of Western literalism. But so Elijah did come. He was John the Baptist, but he was actually John the Baptist, a completely different person, no reincarnation, not brought back to life. But he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's what we find in Luke 1, 17. And others, one of the prophets, one of the prophets. Matthew gives another name. Uh, it's a little, Matthew has a little longer account. You know, this is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's in all three of the Gospels. And Matthew says Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one, another, one of the other great prophets who prophesied uh, during the period when uh, the two tribes of Judah were overwhelmed uh, by Babylon. And so he was highly regarded, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. So <clears throat> there were a number of ideas about who Jesus was. There was confusion about him. And so they just didn't, they just didn't know. And, and so it says, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who, who do you say that I am? Now, the you here is plural. The you is plural. That's a very important point. Jesus is asking all the disciples. There may have been a considerably longer discussion about this issue that we, uh, we, we're not given all the details about. There might have been quite a bit of discussion. But at some point, as it kind of wound down, I get the impression, he says, but who do you say that I am? And so he's addressing all of the 12 disciples. They're all there. So... <clears throat> Uh, 
we have Peter's response, and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, he, he gets it right, doesn't he? Uh, there, there are um, uh, different ways that it is answered in, in the synoptic gospels. Synoptic gospels means with the same view, and that means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're very similar. Mark was probably written first. Matthew and Luke may have very likely had Mark uh, when they did this. By the way, I want to address another issue that I have been every once in a while confronted with. People will say, well, wasn't the Bible written, the New Testament written in Hebrew? I said, no, it wasn't written in Hebrew. Well, oh, Aramaic. Aramaic and, and Hebrew, by the way, are the same script, have the same letters, but it's a different dialect altogether, different language. Uh, I remember there was a fellow a long time ago by the name of Victor Paul Werewill who started a group called The Way, and he claimed that the New Testament was written in Aramaic and that only he had a copy of it. And I debated him on two different occasions, and I asked him if he would produce that New Testament in Aramaic, and of course he could not, would not, he said. But the New Testament is written in Greek, what we call Koine or common Greek. There is no indication that there's any other language behind it. Aramaic, especially not Hebrew. There may have been a document we call Q or Quelle from the German word source that could have been in another language in Aramaic. There could have been a, a document, you know, we know that in the synagogues they would have had. Hebrew scrolls, the scripture in Hebrew. Uh, but the people didn't speak Hebrew anymore, except for the learned ones. And uh, so the New Testament is written in Greek. That There's no manuscript of the New Testament like that in, in the early, early century that uh, is, um, is written in Hebrew or Aramaic. So the New Testament is written in Greek. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have this story. Matthew has Peter's reply, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mark has, You are the Christ, which we see. Which Matthew has too, but Matthew adds, The Son of the living God. Luke has, The Christ of God. A little bit different, and sort of a, a more taking after Matthew. Now, <clears throat> Remember I said that uh, it's likely that Mark was written first and Matthew and Luke had Mark. You say, well, why did they change? Or you might say, well, which is the correct one? There's where we bring up again the, the concept and the idea that the Bible is an Eastern document, not a Western document, not to be taken literally. They can all differ with the, each other, and it doesn't bother them. There was not an attempt to harmonize later on. There was no conspiratorial group that got together that we're going to make everything fit. It's one of the things that authenticate the scripture. But it also reveals uh, the way that the early church looked at inspiration. They didn't have to have everything match. The documents, although they differ in the words between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they say the same thing. What is being said by Peter, which was the, the agreement, the consensus with all of the disciples, that you are the Christ. Very direct statement. You are the Christ. And then it says, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Tell nobody. Again, Jesus wasn't looking for publicity. He wasn't establishing a brand, as people like to say these days. He wasn't trying to do anything other than minister and teach his disciples. It was important for them to come to the place where they saw who he was, even though they would not for a long period of time, even after the crucifixion and resurrection, have a full view of who Jesus really was. It was a growing thing. It's like that with every Christian. When I first became a Christian, I knew you could have told me almost anything about Jesus. 
I was years, 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 many years after I spent 10 years in seminary, I was still learning about who Jesus was. I'm still learning about who Jesus is. It's something that just grows. You, you can't handle something so large and so wonderful uh, just right off the bat. Would have been the same for, for the disciples. Now, <clears throat> how did Peter know about this? It's very interesting in Matthew's gospel. I want to read this to you. Matthew's uh, account of this. And I want to give you what, what Jesus said after Peter said, you are the Christ. Here's what he said to them. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. But my Father who is in heaven. In other words, we don't have that in Mark and Luke. I don't know why. But we do have it in Matthew, so we, we are able to speak to that. In other words, Jesus is very clear saying to Peter and then to the rest, you didn't figure this out by yourself. It, your, your thinking is that you're confused. Now, they knew it wasn't John the Baptist, but maybe Elijah, maybe Jeremiah, maybe who knows who else. They didn't know about that. They were perhaps unclear. But it takes the revealing of the Holy Spirit for anybody to see, and you see it on your screen. The Holy Spirit of God teaches us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer, Emmanuel, Judge of all, Lord God, all of these things and more. I mean, the list could be three or four times longer than this one. I give you six. But that it, it takes the revelation of God directly to us before we're ever going to understand who Jesus is. Try as I might, before I was a Christian, tried to figure out who Jesus was, and I just couldn't. You know, we liked it. We come up with stuff like, well, he's a prophet, a great teacher, a holy man, a perfected man, one of the gods. The Archangel Michael is a group that says that. The per a perfect man who was elevated to deity top rung of the karma ladder, embodied, he embodied Christ's consciousness. Those are what we usually come up with. This is what we usually get the idea of, but it takes the revelation of God for us to see who Jesus really is. And I suggest that you can ask God and say, would you reveal to me who Jesus really is? So long.